Hi guys, my name is Tom Murray. I'm an associate in the sports group Mishcon Dorea and also head of the Mishcon Sports Law Academy. Now this video is all about financial fair play in football and we're going to be focusing on three key themes today. First of all, we're going to be looking at what financial fair play is. We're then going to be looking at the different regulatory regimes that govern it. And finally, we'll be looking at what happens for club breaches FFP. So let's start off with the first question. What is financial fair play? Now, FFP was originally devised as a concept back in 2009 by UEFA, the governing body of European football, following the 2008 financial crisis. The first regulations governing FFP were introduced by UEFA in June 2010, with the first assessments made in the 2013-14 season. OK, so what are the objectives of FFP? In UEFA's words, the objectives of FFP were to improve the economic and financial capability of clubs, to encourage clubs to operate on the basis of their own revenues, as opposed to others, to introduce more discipline and rationality in club finances, to encourage responsible spending for the long-term benefit of football, and to protect the long-term viability and sustainability of European club football. Now, the central principle of FFP is that clubs should live within their own means. And broadly speaking, football-related income should at least match football related expenditure subject to certain exceptions. Now this principle is often called the break even rule and its goal is to encourage discipline and rationality in spending to protect the long term interests of football. But what are the different types of FFP rules? Well people often talk about FFP as being one set of uniform rules, but in fact there are three distinct sets of regulations that we're going to focus on. Now, perhaps the most well-known example is the UEFA Financial Fair Play regulations. Now, we'll talk more about these later, but as a brief overview, these only apply to clubs that are competing in UEFA competitions, in particular, the Champions League and the Europa League. Now, the Premier League also have their own set of financial fair play rules, known as the profitability and sustainability rules. Now, these are fairly short and can be found at rule E5 onwards in the Premier League handbook. As you might expect, these rules only apply to clubs that compete in the Premier League. Finally, we have the EFL profitability and sustainability rules, which apply to clubs that are competing in the EFL Championship. Now, confusingly, these are originally called the Financial Fair Play rules and were adopted by the EFL back in April 2012. They were then replaced at the end of the 2015-16 season. And you can find these rules at Appendix 5 of the EFL regulations. So now we have the background to FFP, but why were these rules actually introduced? Well, one of the key reasons for introducing financial regulation in football was to prevent overspending. Now let's focus on this question from the perspective of EFL clubs. From 1992 to 2013, more than 50 EFL clubs suffered insolvency events, including 18 from 2004 to 2012. In 2011, net annual losses of championship clubs was 189 million, with an average net loss of 8 million per club. Financial regulation was therefore introduced to limit what the EFL considered to be reckless spending. Now, a particular concern for the EFL was that clubs would spend beyond their means as a gamble to either get into or stay in the Premier League in order to reap the significant financial rewards in the form of broadcasting revenues, which in the Premier League can be worth between 100 and 160 million a year. Now, this is similar to the stated aim of UEFA's FFP regulations to prohibit clubs from overspending in pursuit of success in order to avoid financial difficulties. Now, perhaps a more cynical view of FFP is mentioned by Kieran Maguire in his book, The Price of Football. And that is that the more established European clubs were concerned about the arrival of new money to football in the form of Manchester City and PSG, which threatens the footballing hegemony. Now, by introducing controls on their spending, UEFA's established clubs could protect their position and maintain the status quo. However, as we said, this is quite a cynical view. So how does FFP actually work? Well, let's start by looking at the UEFA model. Under the UEFA FFP rules, clubs are required to meet a break-even requirement. Despite its name, this doesn't actually mean that clubs have to break even. Instead, they're permitted to lose up to 5 million euros over a three-year period, as what's called an acceptable deviation. Now this acceptable deviation can be increased up to 30 million euros over a three year period, 
if this excess, i.e. the amount between 5 million and 30 million, is covered by contributions from equity participants. This basically means that the club's owner injects equity, i.e. they put money into the club in exchange for being issued shares. Now, an important point to bear in mind here is that certain costs are excluded when assessing whether clubs have met the break-even requirement. And this includes money spent on youth development, on community development, on women's football, and even things like stadium, infrastructure, and facilities costs. In the UEFA model, clubs are assessed over an aggregated three-year monitoring period. Now, this includes the current season, which is known as T, the previous season, which is known as T minus one, and the season before that one, which is known as T minus two. Now, what this means is that you take the total of all three seasons together and work out whether there's been a profit or a loss. As an example, if a club makes a profit of 20 million in its current season, being T, but it made a loss of 10 million for the previous two seasons, i.e. lost minus 20 over those two seasons, then overall the club will have met the break-even requirement. As we touched upon earlier, the Premier League's version of FFP is called the Profitability and Sustainability Rules. Now, like the UEFA model, clubs are assessed over a three-year reporting period. Now, the key distinction that we need to remember here between the Premier League and the UEFA system is the amount of money that clubs are permitted to lose. Premier League clubs are permitted to lose 50 million over a three-year period. Now, this is three times more than UEFA's acceptable deviation. However, when the owners inject equity as secure funding, clubs are allowed to lose up to 105 million over a three-year period. Now, this is 75 million more than the acceptable deviation under the UEFA model. Now, like the UEFA model, Premier League clubs' expenditure on certain costs, including women's football or youth and community development, is excluded. Now, these costs shouldn't be underestimated and can be significant, with some clubs spending around 40 million on such activities over a three-year period. So now let's focus on the EFL Championship profitability and sustainability rules. Now, rather confusingly, the EFL Championship rules on financial fair play are also called the profitability and sustainability rules, or PNS rules for short. Now, the EFL's PNS rules are similar to that of the Premier League and the UEFA, and they have a three-year monitoring period. They also have similar exclusions, allowing clubs to spend money on things like youth development, women's football, and community development without these forming part of a club's PNS calculation. Again, the key distinction is the amount that clubs are permitted to lose before they face any sanction. Clubs in the EFL Championship are permitted to lose up to 39 million over a three year reporting period, provided that any amount over 15 million is covered by secured funding. Now this amount can be increased up to 35 million a season if during that three year period, the club was a member of the Premier League. So as you can see, there's a real disparity here between the Premier League and the EFL Championship in terms of the loss thresholds, which reflects the significant differences in income between the two leagues. So does FFP create a level playing field? A common misconception is that FFP is even designed to create a level playing field. FFP, by its very nature, allows clubs that make more money to spend more money. As a very basic example, a club such as Manchester United that makes hundreds of millions in commercial income will always be able to spend more than a team like Crystal Palace. It's important to remember that the goal of FFP isn't to put all clubs on the same footing, it's to encourage them to operate within their means, and where a club has more means, it can obviously spend more. Now, some argue that this entrenches a system of inequality, as those who are able to spend their way to success before the introduction of FFP are now able to enjoy the benefits of this, whereas others are prevented from spending to compete with more established teams. So now we understand what FFP is and how it operates, we can now explore what happens if FFP is breached. So let's start by looking at the UEFA model before turning to the EFL model. The UEFA financial fair play regulations are overseen by a body that's called the UEFA Club Financial Control Body. Now this is comprised of two key chambers. We have the investigatory chamber, whose job is to monitor and investigate potential non-compliance. And we also have the adjudicatory chamber, who consider evidence submitted, make judgments, and also determine sanctions. Importantly, the adjudicatory chamber has the power to impose an extensive menu of sanctions, including issuing warning letters, fines, bans from European competitions, and even the power to strip clubs of European titles. 
Many clubs who are charged with breaching the UEFA FFP rules often agree a settlement with the UEFA Investigatory Chamber, as Manchester City did back in 2014, where they accepted a conditional £49 million fine and also restrictions on the European squad and incoming transfers. Another example of a high-profile sanction imposed on an English club is Wolverhampton Wanderers, who were fined and subject to squad size sanctions in the summer of 2020. Now, given the limited time that we've got, we won't focus on the sanctions for breaching the Premier League rules, but we'll instead look at the EFL PNS rules, which you'll remember are the rules that apply to clubs in the EFL Championship. Where championship clubs exceed the upper loss threshold under the PNS rules, a matter is referred to the Disciplinary Commission. The Disciplinary Commission has the power to determine whether a breach has in fact occurred and also is in charge of determining the sanction. In September 2018, the EFL introduced a set of sanctioning guidelines, which are suggestions of the recommended sanction that the EFL board believes the Disciplinary Commission should impose. Now, it should be noticed at this point that the EFL sanctioning guidelines are exactly that, they're guidelines. They did not have any legal force and they're not binding on the Disciplinary Commission, which retains its general power to impose any sanction falling within Regulation 91.2 of the EFL regulations. Now, the starting point for sanctions under the EFL sanctioning guidelines is a 12-point deduction. However, this can either be reduced on a sliding scale, depending on either the quantum of the breach and whether the loss in respect to T, which you remember is the current season, is less than T minus one and T minus two, either the previous season and the season before. The EFL can also request that this sanction is increased by an additional nine points for certain aggravating factors. Now, there have only been a handful of cases under the existing PNS rules, including those involving Birmingham City, Sheffield Wednesday, and Derby County. As you can probably tell, financial fair play in football is complex and it's a highly contentious topic. Sports lawyers will often work hand in hand with clubs, their auditors, and their accountants to help navigate and interpret the complex labyrinth of rules and regulations that apply. The financial challenges that clubs face have been exacerbated by the pandemic, meaning that those in the football industry will be focusing on a financial fair play now more than ever. We hope you've enjoyed today's session. If you do have any questions, please do get in touch. And thank you very much for watching. <laughs>